Oh my God, Gunter, are we live? <laughs> it's that time again. It's the Berkey and the Badger board game battle show. It's going to get wild. It's going to get wacky. It might even be a little insane. We're going to talk about board games and the board game industry. And, you know, we might talk about anything else we want to talk about. <laughs> It's that time again! We're live on the Berkey and Badger Board Game Battle Show, Episode 53, The Kickstarter Evolution! Woohoo! Woohoo! Hello! That's Chaz Marler. What am I looking at Chaz Marler for? Hello! <laughs> yeah, what are you Hello, doing looking at Chaz How are you all doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, hey, my buddy, old to... that Barry. How are you doing? I'm doing very fine. I can't find my script. Where's the <laughs> script gone? We don't go by a script. What are you talking about? Don't you know this yeah, is this is a fly by the seat of the pants operation here. Yeah. Okay then. Uh, well, hello, Berkey, my old friend, better known as uh, Kevin Wrong Thingsmeyer. Wrong Thingsmeyer? Yeah. What do, What am I wrong things about? You You posted something, didn't you? Uh, and it was the wrong I... thing. I had like spelling errors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have an awesome show today because we are so excited. We have with us Gunta and Uva Eichert from Academy Games and Apollo Games. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm Hello. Nice How are you? Here. Oh, my voice sounds high. Hello. <laughs> I, I think That's you should better. do your Arnold Schwarzenegger voice. I am good. I am Are you Uba. making fun? Are you I, making I, fun of us? I just sound weird when I do a German English accent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you should not be wearing your German lederhosen right now. It makes your voice higher. That's why I always take them off when I sit. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. I want to see these later hose and do it now. <laughs> no. He made me look down. It's not pretty. This is a family show. Yeah. <laughs> and that was what what we we much. <laughs> I appreciate having us, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, we're thrilled to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some things that you guys are doing in the industry. And uh, uh, it was kind of funny, Uva. I was looking at... Uh, I, I was looking for a picture for our marquee, actually, and one of the first image pictures that came up in my search, and you might not remember this, but in 2015 at Gen Con, uh, I was doing uh, interviews for Board Game Theater, and I actually did an interview with Academy Games, and that was the picture that came up on my Google search. Wow. Yeah. Wow, well, that's good because uh, I've tried to delete all of my early movie <laughs> pictures uh, because they're very embarrassing. You know, it's before, before I had all this work done. Yeah, before I had all the work done. So, oh, you know, the work, because now you can make really good movies in California, right? Well, yes, and the work is not above, it's, it's anyway, we won't talk about that work, but it, it did help my movie career there for a while. It's a little nip and a little tuck and... Today's key word in the podcast is dangleberries. Okay. Yes, <laughs> the dangleberries. <laughs> I will put a I will put a sound effect for every time someone says dangleberries. Dangleberry. <laughs> Ding. Dingleberry. Well, before we get into it all, Barry, why don't you tell us what you've been up to with Berkey and Badger? Oh, Berkey and Badger have moved from Podcast Garden now to Lipson. Yes. We are still providing the, the top quality quality uh, stuff that we do, but we've just moved home. We've got a bigger house and everything. We've got like a room next to our house, which is like connected to Spotify, so you can find us there. And we've also got um, our house, which is connected to all our sites, so everything should be up to date all the time. And, and we can keep count as well of how many people are actually watching us instead of trying to guess. So yes, I've been I've been I've been the dog slave of Berkey. There, he's asked me to try and find out everything I can and find which is the best place to go to because we needed to upgrade, and uh, Lipson is the the place to go. And uh, yeah, I've been doing that. And I think um, one, of, 
one of the things that's going to be really great about Libsyn is that a lot of our social media tags and for people to find the podcast uh, is going to be a lot more fluid. We're going to continue to podcast on Podcast Garden as well um, so that we still have that audience. But you're going to find a lot of new stuff coming from Berkey and Badger. So stay tuned for all of that. Yeah, the Dangleberry section. We're going to add a new section to the show called the Dangleberries. There'll be a separate page on the website, right? Yeah, and you won't be able to see that in the YouTube video. You won't be able to hear it in our podcast unless they're there. Anyway, yeah. Uh, have good news. Dangling way on the bottom of the page, right? Yeah. Yes. Way on the bottom of the page. Way down low. Really Swing low. low. I have yes. some good news as well. I have finally, yeah. finally gotten through one of the curses on the seventh continent. Yes! Ooh. After over like 45 hours worth of playing, I've managed to survive to the end. And so wow. I have that sensation over me. And uh, now I have to, uh, now I have that sensation there. I can crack on and composing more music for the seventh continent. So may I ask <sighs> Barry, 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 I just noticed, I feel like I'm on the Monty Python show. Where are you from? Because you pronounce all words differently like they should be pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an Englishman in France. So I am, I, all my words will sound a bit strange. They might sound a bit dorset -y. I might be from the south of England, buddy. Okay. Which, um, so, yes. Can you say, yeah, boy? Yeah, boy. Okay, <laughs> I can hear it. That's not. I, I, I heard the Kentucky in you. So oh, right. That was throwing me off. I was trying for like a London kind of Cockney voice. Yeah, boy. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, no. Barry, Barry does a very good oi, English oi, accent. Oi, oi, oi. Leave those apples and pears alone, mate. Because my name is Mark McCain. Not <laughs> I've, I've got a good English accent also. Oh? I visited England once. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? <laughs> no. Uh, oh, oui. Ça, ça c'est super très bien, ça. Yes. Yeah, well, I was trying for the Edinburgh accent there, so. So I'm, I'm not allowed to do German accents on this show. I have to remember that. <laughs> no German accents. <laughs> Write it down. No German accents. Because we didn't start the war. No. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't whoa, mention whoa. the war. Don't <laughs> mention the war, Barky. Whatever you do, yeah, don't mention the war. I think I got away with it. We don't like war games, so don't even go there. <laughs> no, they're tactical yeah, control games, right? Sorry. Tactical, tactical area, area. Yes, team. Team tactical area control games. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Some of the best. Well, <laughs> John Keys is gone, so don't worry. <clears throat> <laughs> so what have you been up to then, Berkey? We, we gone well, Berkey? I am getting ready for a kick uh, for convention season. And, you know, as you as many of you know, we've just been crazy busy with game toppers or right in the middle of fulfilling our project, our Kickstarter and our right in the middle of production and everything. So right in the middle of that, we have Con of the North. So if any of you are going to be at Con of the North in Minneapolis coming up the 16th through the 18th, I'm going to be there. Also going to be up in Salt Con, Salt Lake City, Utah Ooh. on the 1st through the 4th uh of uh, march which is really fantastic and then i'm also getting ready this is something really cool um miniature market is is based in st louis missouri but they are opening up a a board game superstore this superstore is going to encompass 6500 square feet fantastic right and 3,500 square feet dedicated just to board gaming. And Steve and I have developed a friendship over the last few years. And, and Steve is actually, uh, has purchased six of our, our homes toppers and six of the Mycroft, the big Warhammer tables. And uh, they're going to be in that showroom. And I'm going to be there with our good friend, Robert Oren from uh, the Robert Oren YouTube channel. And we're going to be doing a live media event. Uh, with Robert, and Robert's going to be on our next Berkey and Badger board game babble show. So that's super, me. well, you know about it. But 
<laughs> it's going to be super exciting. And uh, so we're going to be doing that. And then right after that, we go to the Gamma Trade Show, Ooh. Reno, Nevada. Are you guys, uh, Gunta, Uva, are you going to Gamma? Definitely. Yep. We're going to be there. You know, I'm, I'm just wondering what to expect because I love collecting all the cards. You know, when you're walking along the street, it's the only city, Las Vegas, where you can get a whole game together without paying for it, just walking down the street. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> we really like those. <laughs> we collect the cards, and, you know, all you have to do is you dial a number, and more gamers come right to your room. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is the first year that it's uh, in Reno. So have you ever been to this resort before? I've never even been to Reno. Yeah, I've never been to Reno either. I thought it was like another hotel in Las Vegas when they first said it, you know, the Reno. I thought, eh, you know. I haven't even been to Mexico. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, You'll be going loco down in Acapulco, you know that. Because okay. you you'll be going loco down in Acapulco. Drinking wow. pina coladas. Yeah, because Reno. Do you play your guitar often on your show? No. Okay. Not yes, he does. Yes, he does. Oh, he wow. goes. He, we jump into song all the time. Sometimes. Well, it, I, we were really impressed because it allowed us to really equalize our speakers way down. So <laughs> I, did, I did appreciate the intro. So thank you. Well, Sorry. if you need any, if you need any music <laughs> for your game apps, Barry's been doing some work for Monolith and for Seventh Continent with soundtracks. Actually, he's really quite a composer. Oh, really? Wow! Sorry. Wow! Yeah, look at him. He's turning. He's turning blush. So, uh, hey, I got something I want to share real quick with you, and we're going to move on and and talk about a couple of things. But in in our Kickstarter, uh, where where Game Toppers uh, finished up in November. Um, we, we, we've just had an incredible amount of excitement about our, our campaign with our backers. It's just been such a fantastic thing. And one of the things that uh, one of the backers sent me this message, and I just wanted to share it because I thought it was so fantastic. He's, uh, I asked his permission could, if we could do this, but I'm going to get my old man glasses on here. <laughs> his name is Christopher Ballinger. Now I got to tell you, this is going to be awesome. I don't know about you folks, but the anticipation I feel right now reminds me of being a kid again, waiting for Christmas morning. With that in mind, and with sincere apologies to Mr. Clement Clark Moore, I might have a little fun. <laughs> the night before game night. "'Twas the night before game night, and all through the day, the excitement was growing. I can't wait to play. The house was all ready, from front door to gable, but one thing was missing, a game topper table. The game room seemed empty, so cold and so dreary. It made my soul sad. It made my heart weary. It cannot be helped, I finally said. There's nothing to do. I'll just go to bed." So there I was sleeping, my wife gently snoring, when I woke to a noise, it came without warning. I thought to myself, what's making such a clatter? So I sprang from my bed to see what's the matter. I snuck down the steps, just me and my jammies, a wood bat in hand in case I would have to give a whammy. And there in my game room stood the intruder. Intruder he stood, but I knew right away that his intentions were good. His eyes were a twinkle, goatee white as snow, and the end of his mustache curled up in a bow. He wore a tall hat. It just looked so quirky. I knew in a moment that it must be St. Berkey. Oh. <laughs> he said not a word, but went straight to his work. He assembled my Watson and then turned with a jerk. And as I was thinking, what a great place to game, he held out his hand and I heard him explain. I'm sorry it's late. I just wanted everything right. Sure hope you enjoy it and have an awesome game night. Nice. Dub sound effect. Beautiful. Was that amazing? That that was really cool. I, I tell you, we're our topic today, and we're going to get this later in the show as the babble topic, but we're going to be talking about the evolution of Kickstarter. But that's one of the things in this Kickstarter environment. There's been such a great evolution, 
and the community is so fantastic. And we have some experts on the show because they've done a lot of Kickstarter campaigns. And so we're going to talk about that. But I just wanted to share that and many kudos to Christopher for uh, sharing that with us. And people just loved it. And it just shows the enthusiasm and the passion that that the community has. And I'm so grateful, so thankful for that. I can't wait to hear it to music now. That's what we need to do. There yeah. you go, Barry. <laughs> I don't know the words. Come on, you're supposed to sing. Oh. The night yeah, before you Christmas. <laughs> Not That's the way it'll be. Twas the night before game night and all through the day. The excitement was growing. I can't wait to play. Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> da, 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 da. Hey, uh, what we're going to do is we wanted to introduce uh, Gunta and Uva uh, as they are our new sponsors that are, are also sponsoring in conjunction with uh, Arcane Wonders, the Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble Show. Guys, thank you so much for that. Well, Dump we never saw your show before we committed, so uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, I, I might get a cancellation notice from PayPal then, right? <laughs> so anyway, it's just such a pleasure to have you guys as a sponsorship. I've been a long time uh, fan of Academy Games. I own almost all of them. And uh, that's, a, that's a real sincere thing. I had the pleasure of meeting you at Gen Con and getting to know you guys a little bit. You guys uh, were gracious enough to help out with our Game Toppers uh, inaugural you know, uh, push for, for them. And I know you guys have a couple game toppers for your show kits and that type of yep. thing. But in addition, uh, right now you are doing a Kickstarter with your pride of Babylon agents of mayhem. And I thought for, for this sponsorship spot, what we'll do is we'll just talk a little bit about what you got going on. And if you could tell us a little bit about that, that uh, campaign. Well, I'll introduce here Gunta. He's going to do it. Yeah. So yeah. We're we're doing our first non-historical uh, historical board game. Oh, I know. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, it, it's a little ominous and very exciting. But uh, yes. yeah, we, we we took all of our experience from doing really good historical games that only a small amount of gamers care about, and we're applying that to these really great themes like Agents of Mayhem. So all of our awesome historical gameplay, we're now throwing in over-the-top characters and storylines that is uh, allowing us to have a lot of fun with it. A lot of people don't know. They think we just do board games because we got into the market because of our military context, working with uh, different military services, doing military training games. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, this big software company calls and says, we love your military games. Would you want to do a first-person shooter? And we're like, eh, you know, never heard of you guys. They he go, never well, heard we do of like them. Saints Row and all that. I go, <laughs> I'm really? already a big fan. Yeah, they go, where is it sold? And they go, well, like Walmart and all that. I'm like, really? So I go to Walmart. I go, you ever hear of Saints Row? And the guy goes, yeah, that whole top row. And I'm like, okay, there could be something to this. So uh, we actually showed them a 3D game that we've been working on for military tactics uh, on in Fallujah, military squad level tactical training game in Fallujah. They loved it. So we put this really cool new blanket over it. And now instead of just shooting with machine guns and mortars, you're using teleharpoons and all kinds of cool stuff and in a 3D map board. Yeah, Agents of Mayhem is set near future where this super villain organization known as, as Legion has basically taken over the world by overpowering all the nations and somehow getting rid of all nuclear weapons. And they use their superior technology to dominate the world. Now, the Agents of Mayhem were formed, a bunch of group of ragtag anti-heroes, to uh, uh, stop Legion in their maniacal plans. <laughs> you know, and this is my problem, because even in Star Wars, I'm an Empire fan. Because here they are, they're bringing the universe together, getting trade going. They're just here in Legion. They got rid of all nuclear weapons, trying to make one country out of the whole world. I mean, 
That's a good cause. Except in the meantime, they're deploying, deploying these destructive doomsday devices that are changing gravity, freezing entire city blocks, it's, messing with the flow of time. That's not nice. It's Legion land. It's like Disneyland, just Legion land. Just look at it that way. So it's, it's a um, tactical type of game on a 3D type of – here, I can even show a picture with the camera – of a 3D oh, type yeah. of boards. And with buildings and all kinds of cool 3D objects in modern day, upcoming Seoul, Korea. And what's even more incredible is the gameplay and the storyline. So anything you do ripples forward and affects the rest of the game. It's not a legacy type of game. It because is, you can always reset it. It's more like storyline. I love storylines, but instead of being only He's one about path, time stories. Of time stories uh, it is just a multiple facet where you can win hundreds of different ways. So it's like no other game out there right now because I love games like Gloomhaven and Charterstone and all that. Love what they're doing. And right. It's almost in line with what we're doing, but without the holding you into one storyline. And we're throwing the weight of our tactical board game experience behind it, making yeah. really – Deep tactical games, but that are also really easy and accessible to even non uh, war gamers. Yeah, yesterday morning I actually watched your playthrough that both of you did, and uh, it was very exciting to see, you know, about the tactical movement, and then the the fact that there's so much innovation in the game by having the multiple tiers because people have the higher ground, so to speak, and that'll give right. them an advantage and. You know, you've got the guy up there taking pictures. You, you know, you've got stuff going on that that's really innovative, and 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 the fact that those levels can actually collapse given certain situations provides like a, a crazy amount of variability. The way I was seeing it. Yeah, we're we're hoping to uh, show. We're going to be doing another gameplay video this week where we're going to be that first video. We made it short intentionally just so people could have a short video to give them a just a basic idea of how the game works. And then we're going to be doing a longer video that will show off some of the destructible terrain and some of the advanced uh, gameplay features that we haven't shown off yet. Because this isn't a game just where you go in and walk in a room, the bad guys come, you roll some dice. If you live and kill them all, you go next room. This is really a, a fun, interactive, almost like a puzzle game because it's the campaign and the storylines and what you're trying to do is just phenomenal. And the missions are objective-based. <laughs> The yes. goal isn't just to kill the other guy. Yeah. It's you have an objective. And if you don't complete that objective and you kill all the other guys, you're still not going to win the mission because you didn't complete your objective. And we try to make these objectives very diverse, humorous a lot of times. Yeah. And that way, every game has a slightly different feel to it. Yeah. Like the one we are showing demoing, the main thing is they're trying to make a good uh, propaganda movie, you know, for the mayhem. So promotional video, not propaganda. Well, I'm thinking from the Legion <laughs> side. <laughs> it is the German in me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, that's why I love the Legion. Um, but here, you know, instead of – you have to also think in this game, hey, how am I going to get a really good picture of blowing up these Legion guys and making good explosion? And that's how you get more victory points. So we're having a really good time with it. And um, people have to realize – when they come over, they think, oh, you guys just do war games. No. Every week we play Pathfinder. We, we play a lot of Euro games too. Yeah, we're not war gamers. It just happens what, how we got into the industry. So now we're doing our fantasy and sci-fi games under another division called Apollo Games. Yeah. So Apollo Games yeah. is a division of Academy Games. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because it's, you know, you are known for these historically rich thematic games that have historical feel. You know, I was first introduced to 1775 and love that game. And, uh, you know, likewise, then, you know, you had the, you know, was a 1774 and uh, you've got, you know, Vikings. I think I have it up here. Vikings 878, you know, Mayor Nostrum is one of my favorite games. Uh uh, they're so rich and and the quality of production and the attention to the gameplay freedom the underground railroad yeah. handling a sensitive topic in such a fantastic thoughtful educational way you know that you're known had, for that stuff that just had uh, Fremont Underground Railroad had a whole article section in the Wall Street Journal last week 
Wow. And guess what? We like sold out over the weekend. <laughs> it was like crazy. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it was great. Well, and, and you've been you've been known for that. So you have a pedigree of quality. You have a pedigree of understanding how to make make themes. You know, be good games and not just just be about the theme, but actually good games. And so now you're taking that expertise into this new line, this Apollo line, to create different genres. So it's just not in that area control tactical environment. And that's yeah. what's so difficult when we're doing a Kickstarter. Um, people see our cool minis on, they think, oh, it's another mini game. And it isn't. This game is, if you like a storyline and just interaction and a totally new gameplay that really well has tension and it, strategy it's, to it. It's really choice driven. Mm -hmm. It's the you in this game, you there's the rules are not complex. But what is complex about it is that the pure huge amount of choices you have. And decision making. And um I, I kind of want to touch on what you're talking about with uh, how our pedigree with our past games and how we put these great, really historical, thoughtful themes on it. And I think the key thing uh, people have to consider when we move to the non-historical stuff is that with all those past games and these non-historical games, we first build just a, a good, fun game engine with no consideration for theme. And that's true mm. for any of our games of the past and the games of the future. And then we really go down, really learn the history intimately, and we put that historical blanket over the game. And what's mm. really interesting about Ages of Mayhem, we treat it as his history. We studied the, the storyline and the theme, intimately understand the history of the game. Go Legion! And applied it as <laughs> if as a bl historical blanket over this engine we built. So it, it's funny that our experience design historical games actually benefited a lot in developing a board game based off a video game franchise. Yeah, no, I, I think it's fantastic. I I wish you all the best in the world. It's on Kickstarter right now, and you've already raised $130,000 going into a new venture game line. I mean, that's fantastic. And uh, that's only the beginning. So there's a, there's a lot more to come there. There's fantastic miniatures. There's all kinds of stretch goals and different things that you're, you're unlocking and communicating. How many days are left on the campaign? Uh, we, have we have 13. 13 more, yeah. And, and what's cool about this, after this Kickstarter, we're going to be continuing to support the system with more content. This isn't just a, we're going to release a bunch of cool stuff with the Kickstarter, and then that's all. We're, we're going to keep releasing content out for it and keep supporting this game to really grow a, a great system and a great community. Yeah, we're already working game. on the second game in the series. So. Yeah. Anyway, so let's continue with some singing, Barry. Okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I want to get out my PlayStation now and, and play some games because I'm looking. It's, it's Deep Deep Silver, the developers. Yes, yeah. Deep, yep. Silver, Deep Volition, Silver Volition. I they did the same chat. Pro. Yeah, the chat the is chiming in too. Jesse Seiki said that uh, Mayor Nostrum Empires is my third favorite game of all time. Oh, oh thank awesome. you. Thank you know what? I, I can understand it. it. It is also my third favorite game after Conflict of Heroes in 1775. Yeah. Just like him, I'm sure. Wow. <laughs> we'll be an outside, yeah. He's very, he's very quick. <laughs> well, Barry, I think it's time for us to move on to our news segment, Things That Make You Go mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Let's get the drop. Let's do the music. Things That Make Us Go Hmm. Board Game News. Berkey and Badger reflect on the current events that are happening in the board game industry. Some may be good, some may be bad, but there are all things that make us go, hmm. Hey. Woohoo! <laughs> well, Barry, what has been making you go, hmm? Apart from Google Hangout not working at all anymore, again. <sighs> Yeah, but, yeah. And not being able that's, to find that's my a script. Yeah, because I'm having to use other systems and back passages and dangleberries to, to, to get it going. Right. <clears throat> What's, ask me again. <clears throat> What's well, been making what, me go hmm? What hmm. things have been making you go hmm? Well, recently I just heard and we've just read somewhere uh, that Richard Ham of Rado Runs Through is oh, moving yeah, back to the States. He's been Woo. 
he moved to Malta a very, very long time ago with his video game company. Video games, there's a nice tie in there. And um, he's been living there and he got involved in board games. And he obviously he's a very, very well known uh, board game. Um, I wouldn't say, yeah, he's a reviewer because he does like a, this is what I think about the game at the end. So, um, but yeah, he's moving back to America and uh, that, that's, that's made me go in because that's quite good for him because then postage costs for um, companies are, are going to go down because they won't be, they won't have to send their, their games to him all the way in Malta where there's like huge tax, taxes to be dealt with as you know Berkeley when you ever you sent me stuff to France uh, there's these tax problems which is a nightmare and you know from your game toppers that sending your game toppers anywhere in the world is a, a massive headache for, for tax purposes yeah so uh, yeah I, I'm, ha I'm happy for him it's a shame I'm gonna miss out on that holiday that I was planning to go to Malta and actually hang out with him and play games with him yeah, because... that's the only reason you wanted to go sorry exactly it sounds like he was the only reason you wanted to go to malta no, no I, I have family there <laughs> oh my oh, i thought it was a rado centric vacation it was a rado centric but i wanted to go and see you know my uh my my grandma oh, i can't say it in english grandmother 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 my grandmother's um family so, well i yeah. did hear they had a fantastic rado tour on on malta so it's a shame you're going to have to miss out on that. Yes. Yes. Is. I love that tour. You know, you got the boat, then you got that train ride, and then you get this bus. And playing games on the bus with Rado was awesome. Well, I love, I heard <laughs> the, the boys want to go see the the pyramids there also. So I'm uh, kind of bummed that Nick's not gonna, that he's not going to be there. So I like the Rado pyramid the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's going to be really great for him too, you know, because I I've saw I met him first at BGG Con, I think in 2016, and so he'll probably be able to make the the convention circuit more more easily oh, yeah. as well. So I think that's going to be really great. That's a now. Where is he moving back to? I mean, is it going to be like to America or like to the West Coast? Don't know. I don't. I don't know. Barry, you are the you are the I, purveyor of great information. Where is I'm he moving? No, I just saw a little tagline somewhere. I think it was on it was on board game geek. Someone wrote a little message saying, "I think it's moving." Ah, you heard it here. You heard it here first at Berkey and Badger, guys. Yeah. I don't know where he's moving. Even on his Facebook page, it doesn't even say. So, um, well, I'm going to take the selfish route, and I'm going to just say it. He's moving to Kentucky, and so we're very happy that he's going to be moving to Kentucky. And since Kentucky is very close to Bo uh, Origins and Gen Con, he can go from Kentucky very quickly. So I've said four times now, it's the truth. Kentucky. Okay. Is he going to be warehousing separately or, you know, synergistically with you in your space? Yeah, everything I've heard, he's going to be um, moving into <laughs> our offices here. He's and, talking uh, a load of fried chicken now, I'll tell you. Well, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> He's talking yes. about dangleberries. This is the <laughs> selfish version of the show. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got a couple things that made me go, hmm. First thing was I heard and read about North Star Games are going to map MAPP pricing. So they're going to institute a, a map uh, policy to have some price protection of their product. But the thing that made a lot of companies are doing that, and what, you know, Uva and Gunta, you might might have some comments about this. But uh, they also did something that I that made me go hmm, and that was that they were putting some restrictions on distribution, particularly with Amazon. And I found that very interesting, given that there is emerging more discussion about the problem with board game counterfeiting. Uh, Christian Peterson, head of Asmodee, you know, started talking in depth about that in a couple interviews with ICV2. And you're starting to see that some of that problem is handled through some unmonitored things through Amazon. So I found that to be very interesting that North Star was putting restrictions in that channel. How, how do you guys feel about that? Well, I have great advice to like prevent counterfeiting. 
Like we we have a very good policy. Uh, we just we just make sure we don't become p- popular enough that people would want to counterfeit us. <laughs> so, yeah, the first time yeah, I hear anybody it. counterfeiting our game, I'll I'll take it as a compliment. Now, <laughs> the third time through, then we've got some problems, you know. But so, uh, and maybe even if they counterfeit, if they can, you know, make some expansions for us, we'd appreciate that. <laughs> Well, I think you're seeing too, sometimes the, you know, Amazon is kind of undercutting, you know, the, the brick and mortar stores. And I think that was one of the, one of the reasons that, you know, they want to support the local hobby in that area as well. And so I think that might have, you know, some positive effect for that community. I don't know well, how gamers will feel about that. But. Yeah, we're, we're doing the same thing. It's, it's very difficult for us because here we are, we're trying to give good products support the brick and mortars, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden Amazon comes out and starts discounting 35, 40% off MSRP. Mm -hmm. And that is so disruptive, not only for the stores, but also for companies such as ourselves, because we also need to make some money. And if we're cutting out entire store segments, these are billboards that we're driving past. And we may not be thinking about something, but we see it and then we want to buy it. And on Amazon, if you're not directly looking for it, you can get lost. But in a game store, if they're carrying your games on a shelf, people love perusing through games. And it's and and at game stores, you have to have the opportunity to try these games out. Right. Yeah. So you want to purchase them. That I mean, that's the biggest uh, thing I, I love about game stores is that you also get that community around the game store, right. which you don't get when you buy a board game online. And, and so what we're really looking at is with what's made our company very successful is that we have very long tails on our games. I mean, even our Conflict of Heroes games, the first one we came out with was nine years ago, and we still sell hundreds every month. I mean, still one of our best-selling games. So that's because it's in game stores. Uh, mm. I'm afraid if it starts going 100% over to the Amazons and the big discounting online, you see such a short life cycle of a game and then yeah. it just becomes churning and and you just get more crap thrown at you with more miniatures you know and I, I think also with the, the discount you see sometimes there's a problem with perceived value people yes. are putting the value on the game of just what the physical cost of the components are and they are not taking uh an account the tens of thousands of hours that goes into developing this game, especially some of the more deep, complex games out there, right. especially in, when you get into Euro games. Yeah. Um, that the amount of time of the people, the the cost of you, what you have to pay people to help you develop this, that all has to get factored into the cost of the game, and yeah. uh, so it's just an intellectual cost, not just a physical cost that has to be considered. Yeah, I've heard like yeah. Alan Moon has lost like so much money, also to the counterfeiting and all that, and. Um, for for the ticket to ride and games like that, and it's yeah. it is a definite problem. And I, I hope that Amazon is listening and is going to really start um, coming down on. And we're even looking at becoming like vendor of choice on Amazon, so that we only dictate who can sell these games. Now yeah. if we can control that through Amazon. They won't lose sales, but then we can also um, guarantee the quality and the originality of the games. <laughs> Okay, I've got, I think I've, got, I've got something here. Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll just show it to you. This is Amazon. Get screen share, screen share, share. This is Amazon. And on here we have a copy of uh, Level 7 Omega Protocol from Privateer Press on Amazon for £1,118.22. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's because you're an Englishman in France. That's all the taxes added on. <laughs> I won't tell you how much the chess sets are. <laughs> is, is there a game topper in there? Yeah, hopefully. It looks <laughs> like one. There's a Japanese version of Deuce for £900. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wow. But anyway. Well, I think one wow. of the other things that made me go, wow. hmm, is somewhat, go somewhat well. related to this. But Mayor, Mayfair Games... Uh, just was announced that uh, they were picked up by Asmo Day, another great big merger. But one of the one of the product lines of Mayfair, of course, was Catan that was sold one. to Asmo Day, and this the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was 
this was one of the games that they were talking about that was so counterfeited as well because Catan has such a, a huge following. And so people were not only Ticket to Ride, they were doing Catan. And, you know, I don't know everything that's happened with Mayfair here in the last couple of years, but, you know, they acquired Lookout Games. They sold mm -hmm. off Catan assets. And now they're just kind of like – I saw the article actually from Larry Rosini, the CEO, I believe. Ross May, and yeah. Rosny and he said, "Yeah, it's just time to time to wrap up shop." And we've we've reached out to Asmodee, and it seemed like a logical choice. The thing that made me go hmm about it was is it kind of felt like this was like a salvage uh, type mm -hmm. of process. It's like we needed someone to come in and and save the line. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? I don't think so. They had a lot of good games still, still like Agricola, and, and, and the Lookout games are very phenomenal. I Averna. think that um, Larry's put years and years and years and years yeah. into Mayfair and everything. And, uh, you know, after a while, you got to just say, hey, I'm ready to retire. And if there are not other people who really want to step up and take it over, that's one thing. And then how much moolah do you get out of it? You know, you have to make your decision. You know, mm -hmm. if someone come to me and say, hey, Uva, you know, Gunta will give you $35 million for Academy Games. That's what I think it's worth. Yeah. I, yeah. Why not sell it and enjoy life a little? So I yeah. think there's a little more to it because um, they still had a, a lot there. And uh, I think there may be a little more to this. But pe well, people don't realize, as a game publisher, we get to play – very few games because we're so busy developing games and yep. we make sure we play games that stay current and stuff but we don't get to play as many games as we want to right so i, I maybe that's the reason he just wants to actually be a gamer again yeah i don't know i mean i only get to play like seven games a week you know and that's just unacceptable <laughs> only yeah 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 <laughs> Woo. that's so about as many a, as me he's a machine. what he doesn't tell you is he pays people to play with him well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I collect all those cards in Las Vegas, and it takes me almost a year to play through them all. <laughs> okay, the my wife thing is listening. Is, Kari, the I'm thing, kidding. The other good thing that you've got is that you get free T-shirts. We do? Yeah. Oh, no, they, these things you're talking about are candy <laughs> games. Oh, yeah. They're all the same ones day after day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I don't wear the same one. We just actually just switch shirts back and forth. So every yeah. day we're wearing a different shirt. That'd be yeah. a little weird. It'll be interesting to see what Asmodee does with the brand. Oh. You know, oh, because oh, oh. Gen Con was, I, I mean, you went to Gen Con and it, it was that huge Mayfair section, you know, Mayfair Alley and such a huge sponsor and created such a, such a great environment. Do you know what they're going to do? They're going to change the name back to Settlers of Catan. <laughs> That's what they're going to do. Yep. Could be. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Asmodee, though, also, because, you know, we've discussed this. When you take over by a huge company, it's interesting. All of a sudden now you're, you're very limited in your creativity process that you had when you were an independent standalone company. Because, and I'm not saying creativity with new games but then also trying to think outside of the box because you have to structure everything to make it in the corporate uh, path that it's taking. So for us, it's, it's almost a good thing well, that everybody's being bought out because not as many games will be coming yeah. out from these companies because they have to limit what comes out from every... Because I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the, the publishing companies that have to, uh, been bought, instead of putting four or five games out a year, a lot of them only... These design studios are now putting out two games a year. Right. They're great games, but they're allowed to focus on just a few games. And it's it's actually helping with the market saturation problem of thousands of right. games coming out every year that we're seeing. And it doesn't mean that they're going to sell fewer games. It's just that they're concentrating more. And that's how we kind of see it because, um, you know, I've been through a lot of corporate mergers before with our companies. And once a big corporation, uh, you know, last one was a $15 billion company, bought one of our past companies. And all of a sudden, we were like super creative making the deals out in the marketplace. And all of a sudden, it was like, no, it's going to be done this way. And that really is a cultural change. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the gaming market. I think it's for the good. And it'll, it's, I think it's good for new companies to start up. Yeah. Because it, it opens up 
the market a little bit for them and uh it actually lets uh, more, we've been seeing a lot of great new companies start up over the last decade. Right. And I, I think we're going to continue to see that in this kind of uh, consolidation of some of the biggest market players just opens up it more for new uh, cool Especially with Kickstarter. Kickstarter yeah. is like, it's, it's a market breaker. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, we're going to move on to our next segment, What Game is Behind the Door? But before we do that, I'd just like to mention our other sponsor, Arcane Wonders. Um, Arcane Wonders, as many of you know, is uh, uh, has the Dice Tower Essential line of games, and they've produced such great games like Sheriff of Nottingham, Onitama, Royals, uh, also Spoils of War, uh, Speechless, some really fantastic games. But I had a long discussion with Tony Galati, sales manager for Arcane Wonders, and talked about some of the upcoming releases. And you're going to see some information coming, but they have this new fantastic strategy game. It plays like in 15 minutes called Senshi. And what's really cool about this, this is a tile laying game, and it has four different type of attributes. You're trying to gain strength and agility and wisdom and honor. And you complete, and it's kind of this back and forth uh, battle of wits, if you want, if you will, to become the master of your temple. Um, the production looks really fantastic. It's uh, one of these situations where it's uh, uh, really great little stacking tiles, great little player aids but it's one of these accessible games like Onitama that you can bring to the table. And one of the other games that they are bringing, and this is going to be the next Dice Tower Essential game. This is a tactical card game where you are action mechs and it's mech on mech combat and it's called Critical Mass. This is a game that Tom Vassell has been super excited about. It's a two-player game. Play it in like 30 minutes. And, and it's just this hardcore, heavy-hitting, mech-on-mech combat type of thing. And you're the pilot of these massive war machines. And um, it it's, looks really fantastic. From what I've seen of the artwork, it looks really great. And they are super excited about that. Uh, going forward, coming up for Origins and Gen Con, they have some additional titles that they've really been working on. And like always, Arcane Wonders just does a great job with their production values, their commitment to their art assets, all of those kind of things. And I'm sure you're going to see that type of gameplay and those kind of titles. So check out arcanewonders.com. You'll be able to see all of the things that they're offering there in these great new titles. So with that, Barry, we're going to move on to what game is behind the door? We are indeed. Welcome everybody to What Game is Behind the Door. Now in this segment, we'll be putting our special guest to the test by asking them three questions. Questions like, what was the last game that they purchased? What is the game they're most excited about getting? And what is their favorite game right now? Turkey and Magic will have to figure out what these answers are by asking questions in particular styles. Let's find out if Turkey and Badger can get three out of three or fall flat on the floor like a flowering thingy. Thank you. Dingo, dingo balls. Dangleberries. Dangleberries, man. Get your dangleberries on, man. <laughs> okay. Are you guys ready to try to stump the master, Barry and Berkey, in our game show? You got it wrong. Berkey and Barry. Who's Berkey and Barry? Berkey and Badger or Kevin and Barry? Kevin, Kevin and Badger. <sighs> ah, welcome to Babalot, Jesse and Rick and Kabuki. How are you all yeah, doing? Kabuki. Woohoo. I thought I'd do a shout out because nobody's mentioned them on the chat. So I need to hide the chat because we're not allowed to look at you guys answering. Oh, the we got to hide the chat. Yeah, hide we're the hiding chat. the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, so we start with number one. This is what we're going to do. Who's going to answer this question? Is it Gunta or is it you? Uva? Yui. Oh, Yui. Uva. Oh, call me a female Sorry. sheep, will you? <laughs> you know, that is a typical thing of an Englishman living in France. You're confused. 
move to Germany, you'll learn how to say uva. 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 I tell you what, the good thing about living in France is when you watch an old war film, the French speak French, the Germans speak Germans, and the English speak English. And that's one thing I really adore about watching, uh, you know, like um, The Great Escape in, in French. It's, it's right. they speak it in their real language. It's where if you go and watch it in England, they all speak with a tint of French or a tint of. Yeah, uh, but the only problem is Napoleon always wins. So, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead and explain part one, Barry. Okay, so I'm going to ask Uvi, uh, what was the last game that he purchased? And we're going to do this in a kind of 20 questions mode, but we're not going to do 20 questions. We do five questions each, Berkey and I. And uh, you, it, you Uva. Mr. Dangleberry is going to answer by either saying yes, no, or maybe some other response in the middle. Okay, Mr. Dangleberry and Master Dangleberry. Dingleberry, Dangleberry. I'm not going to tell people how that came up before the show started. So that's an old. It's an old English word that my mate used to call me. He used to call me Dingleberry all the time. You're a Dingleberry, mate. So um, yeah, uh, it I, wasn't I'm, a compliment. I, it, I know. it was not. <laughs> you know, I don't care what you've been telling yourself the last forty years, oh, but. <laughs> Still my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, let's start. Question number one, Berkey. Are you gonna start with your typical one? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask, uh, is it in a standard ticket to ride box size? Sized box. Mm. Yeah, nine. No. 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 I don't think he nine. knows what that, that is. Or what I don't think he yeah. knows what box ticket to ride comes in. No, it's always on the game table. So, <laughs> or someone's cop or with someone's pirate in it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Does this game have euros mainly euro style mechanics? Yes. Okay. Right now it's your turn to hold up a component from the game in front of the camera, and we describe it to our viewers who are Just listening. Give watching. it away right away. Well, you shouldn't do. You should start with like a bit more. Hmm. It's okay. a it, it's a it's a one one uh, a coin that has a one denomination on it. Looks like it has some Greek writing around it. Hmm. It's gold. It's gold. One. And gold. you have a very good camera. That's that's amazing. The focus on that. It's just like that was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, he fantastic. made sure he got a great camera to show off all the work he's had done. Yeah. Well, and I did notice <laughs> it kind of looks like your ears meet in the back. Is that because of the multiple uh, faces? Just, just, just don't show them the navel. That's what I'm going to say. Don't show them the navel. <laughs> <laughs> I thought okay. you were doing rivers for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I haven't got a clue, so I'm going to pass. Okay, I'll pass too. So second question from Berkey is, does this have a pickup and deliver mechanism? Yes. I'd say no. I've played it more. Yes. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> what do you uh, mean by pick up deliver? We you pick up something we, and you actually move game. it over the board? No, it's a longer game. We have to pick it up, get off the table so we can eat, and then we put it back down again later on. Right? That's what you're talking this about. Is, this is the way it's going to go. All right. Let's skip to the end credits. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. What you Berkey and Ben? I, I don't know the answer now. So um, pick up and deliver. You're going to pick up resources and you got to take it somewhere. Yes. Okay. Does this Three. game have a Greek theme? No. Okay. Well, the guy looks Greek. It's <laughs> got a big nose. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what are you talking about my nose for? <laughs> <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Oh, shut up, big nose. I'm trying to listen. <laughs> hey, Donnie. Good to see you in the chat, man. Um, and look at these big hands. Ooh, I'm scared. I'm going to stay away. Stay away from my chickens. Huge. Stay away from my chickens. They don't want to be I Kentucky Fried. I don't think Barry's heard about the big hands thing over in France. So go on. Yeah, he's no. little Barry. It's okay. It's focused yes. on the dingleberries. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's, all, it's all about the size of the nose in France. You should know that. Yes. <laughs> like Klinger from MASH. 
Okay. Um, um, so I'm going to have a uh, component moment component. two. Yes. Yeah. So Zeitwerts. Oh, yeah, like, like that. There yeah. you go. There you go. A, Sideways. That's a very okay. nice green meeple. Or, or from the bottom. There you go. That gives yeah. it away. From, it kind of looks like a little wine bottle. I'm going to make a guess. Okay. Like, gosh, this can't be. Zeitwerts is too einfach. I'm not sure if that's a meeple or a dingleberry. <laughs> no. It looks. <laughs> It looks a little bit about the, the lamb is from a dingleberry. Uh, that's I a dingleberry. Like, this is a meeple. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it looks kind of like a pear, you know, a little head and then a big belly on the bottom. Um, that, Don't put I mean, yourself down like that. <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> I, I, there isn't an expansion for Concordia. This could really be you. Look at that, Berkey. Thank it's you. It's got the Thank little topper hat. Mm. Oh, wow. true, true. <laughs> Don says he resembles that remark, too. Okay, I'm You're looking at the chat, are you? You're looking at the it's, chat, you cheat. Oh, I did, but nobody said anything. I forgot. Okay, oh. it's off. <laughs> Get Okay, okay, question number three, B -b 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 Barry. I was I was gonna have a Thank guess. You. At, uh, um, you said Concordia. I was gonna say Deuce. 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 No. No. Deus. Deus. No. Neither one is correct. Okay. This is the last game they just bought. Okay. Okay. Third question, Barry. Okay. Go on. Um, is this a legacy style game? No, no, it would it would be cool though. No, it's not a legacy style game. Okay, meaning that it was designed by the son of a famous famous other designer, correct? Kind of, yeah. Three no, generational I, though. You know, he's I think a first time generation designer. So no, it's not legacy. Hmm. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, I'm happy with the edit of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be um, pretty easy. Just cut most of it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, pick up and deliver. Um, does 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 this game have a map of Europe? No. 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 Okay. Wow. Yeah. They're fighting over what component to put out. <laughs> oh no, I, oh, I already have it component. all planned out. Yeah, all you do this, this is gonna make it easy. Okay. It's brick. a little uh, tile, it, orange tile with some red bricks depicted. We just on talked it. about the and, and it, here, here's the cool thing about it. It's the, it the exact same thing on the other side. <laughs> Double sided yeah. printing. Yes. And bricks. So you know and there's from the 70s or 80s. Mm. There's yeah. three bricks on it. This is that the seems, last game they purchased? That seems like a waste of paint paint on the other side of the, the tiles. Especially oh, by man. hand. When are these game designers going to learn? I tell you, these publishers. Yeah. Well, it's a nostalgic thing. Okay. Because that, that's strange. That tile does look like Concordia. So we're collecting res we're collecting resources. We're shipping them around. We're doing you think something that's how like they that. Pronounce the name of that box, Concordia. Maybe we're just pronouncing it does, the name it wrong. It does start with a K. Yeah. No, oh, it's, I, I, I spell think... Concordia with a K. That's Kevin, I, isn't it? I spell Kevin with a C. Um, I thought his name started with a D. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, uh, question number four, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry? No, oh, nothing. Um. <laughs> so, um, does no, uh, go on. does the it is there is there is is this game? Manufactured in 2017. Give me, give me, look once. Yeah, put it in front of the screen so I can see what it is. Let's see. 
Where's the year on this? Oh, oh no. they don't put a manufacturing year. Oh, um, no. I, I believe it Give was. It dig it. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, I it 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 quickly board game geek it. You know? Yeah. Name's in. Mama in mouth. Cook my name. Yeah. 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 Tight. yeah. Hmm. Uh, it is not 2017. Is it newer than that? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, it came out last week. <laughs> no, it is not. Now, yeah. you said the last game I purchased. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you haven't bought a game since 1980, have you? No, I I really no. I I just I just purchased it. Um, I was at Goodwill getting some clothes, and it was on the shelf. So if that gives you a little bit of <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I get it now. I see how it goes. No, okay. no, this, I'm serious, this is guys, where you get your good historical games, right? Guys, you're gonna you're gonna later on go. This is like a Jerry Seinfeld episode because all the clues are there, and it's all gonna tie together our entire conversation this show is all going to come together at the end okay so this is this we're going to talk With about nothing walking in. <laughs> um, i'm going to say i'm going to say kalis no Ooh, but one, good of my one. Favorite one of my games. favorite games yes all right i've played ahead, that there. game non-sober more than any other game out there and hasn't <laughs> beat me once yes <laughs> he always played solo <laughs> <laughs> all right badger what do you oh, say um i haven't had a question yet so um uh, blah, 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 blah. is farming involved in this game no hmm. i'm not talking about mr michael farmer who's a game designer i'm on about <laughs> the actual exercise now uh, okay no, there's there's no farming in it. There's no farming in it. Okay. No farming. Are there any carrots in there? No. Uh, pumpkins, yeah, maybe. Up, Doc. Pumpkins. Let, me, let me see that one. No, I'm gonna pass as well. Component and moment. Right. Component moment. So do a uh, do a uh, plastic storage bags count? No. I would. That's a good one, Gunta. I'll, I'll I'll move on to a different one. This is my this is einfach machen oder schwerer. Oh, okay. Yeah, get that doctor. Yeah, we'll do this one next. We, we you know can't. What? I prefer Chaz Marla. Chaz Marla was more sympathetic. He even showed us the component moment, which was actually the box we, cover. Oh, we could do this <laughs> here. Just so this here. Uva. Oh, that's a good one. Yep, there we They're go. Messing with us, Barry. I know. What right. the heck? Well, you guys are in the know. You guys know everything. So that looks like a first player token. Okay, it's a hex tile. It has a mechanical drawing on it. Uh, looks like a little invention or something of that natis nature. Mm. A little circle in the middle, little grab, you know. Yeah, drafting. it looks like a plan. It looks like a drawing of a plan of a church or something. Hmm. Mm. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's that Einstein game. <gasps> no, it's not. Oh, good game also. You're talking Not, about Ed Edison versus Tesla, right? Yeah, that's the one. That's a good one. But that's I don't actually think there is a game about Einstein. That there is a game that. about Einstein, yeah. Oh. It's, um, it's a tile-laying shape game. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Einstein, yeah. Zweistein, Dreistein, oh. Vierstein. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah. Should I, should I keep that one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna okay. have to dig up my Ramstein albums and start listening to them again. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm getting okay. hungry for some reason. Oh, okay. let's get some food to go with. Get some, some of the farming. Get some of I the think, farming tiles out. I think I need some spiel. <laughs> um, <laughs> or how about one the wood or stone houses? Which one? Oh, oh get, no. the, get the grist mill. Get the grist mill thing over there. Yeah, grist mill. Do the grist mill. Do you want the to get dwarves or the goblin ones? Oh, get the dwarven ones. Here. Let's put this dwarven one out. It's not, um, um, I was going to say, uh, uh, it's Terra Mystica. No, no, no. 
Why are you showing okay. another component already? Ooh, oh. Okay, just hold that steady it's, again. It's bonus component moment. Hold it. Hold the image towards oh, the. That what's that about? Thick tile, Two point five tile. millimeter. Yeah. And it had armor on it. Body shop. Oh yeah. Oh, come on, give us the picture though. Let us see the picture. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna get yeah, this. Yeah. Can you give me some stripping music, please? Yeah. Da -da 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 <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> well, it has a number three next to like a a piece of armor. I'm gonna have um, a guess. Is it village? No. 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 Now, I could understand wrong, why you said wrong. it was a piece of armor. Oh, now we're at the gun show. <laughs> of course, it's a little pellet gun, but I'll take any gun you say. <laughs> Still no idea. No. Gosh, no, I'm, right, I'm stuck. We'll I guess we're... Side. We'll show you the other side of this one. It's a very popular kind of game. It it's, says librarian. It has plus one gold and two cards. Um, now remember, it's a game war gamers like to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm stumped. Well, How about you? Paint up I'm, great. I'm well, the, the minis paint up great. Oh yeah, the minis are really good too. I think they should. I think they should just tell us because uh, let's have a look at the chat. Here, 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 here. I'll, I'll, the, show, I'll show one the card. <laughs> Okay, Even the so chat still. doesn't seem to steam engine. Steam engine. What? Steam works. Okay, let's give. Let's give yep. one more. We're going to give you one more hint. Hold on. Oh, wait, hold wait, on. wait, wait, wait. Hold hold on. Just, hold I want to show them get a player board. Maybe they can nope. get off that. <laughs> Ready, Quinta? Oh, I know what it is. It's the colonists. Yes. Ta -da! Okay. From 2016. Everybody. I saw, I saw Mayfair oh. lookout logo, and then it then it clicked. Mm -hmm. I purchased this because I heard Mayfair was being sold and bought. So I thought, I'm going to get colonists. He bought their entire warehouse of stock. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Little do you know, my name is really Uva Asmade Eichert. <laughs> so you bought the entire stock, and you're going to stick little stickers on them with your <laughs> logo and sell them that way. <laughs> yes, and we're going to plant them. That's why it's a good farming game. And we're you are help. talking about counterfeits. Yes. So. <laughs> so, well, I guess score number one goes to Uva and Gunta. They number have foiled us. One. Number one. <laughs> my hair. So, part two. <laughs> This is going to attest uh, your your great drawing skills. And this is what game are you most excited about getting? And our guest needs to draw the image and then we're going to explain it. And we're going to see if we can guess what game they are most excited about getting. So should I point the camera on while I'm drawing? Mm, no, it's okay. We're, nah, we're, we're, we'll do some drawing music while you draw. Yeah, okay. so tell us about the colonist. What's so oh. great? What made you go out and buy the colonist? Is it just the fact that Mayflower had been bought out? Mayflower. No, no. Mayflower. My wife likes playing. Her favorite games are like Through the Ages, oh. Agricola. If, if it's a game that is like four hours and in-depth resource building, my wife likes it. Mm. So like Civilization what's that games. Card? Twilight Struggle. Oh, Twilight Struggle is her favorite game, she says. So oh, games like Twilight Struggle, stuff like that. So... You know, she's a good German girl, so she likes yelling a lot and then making up playing a heavy board game. Can we have her on the show? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, You know where? I found her on one of those free card game cards they sell you or give to you in Las Vegas. So I was uh, – it's great. You know, I found a person who came to my house and wanted to play games. <laughs> And it was either well, Gloomhaven or her, you know, it was roughly the same cost, so it was okay. If you could market that, you'd make a lot of money. 
Oh, I can market it. People do market oh those gosh. cards. I didn't realize how repetitive this was going to be. What's this? You he's drawing. He's drawing cubes. That's what he's doing. He's drawing a chessboard. <laughs> and and I'm I actually have the board goes off the page. So uh, wait a minute. This is they're supposed to guess what game you're excited oh, about. Oh, they'll be able to guess this. Oh, I got it already. Come oh, on. you just gave it away. Do, 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 do. Oh, oh it's New York City. No, no, mach's nicht zu einfach. No, no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. you just gave I'll, it away. I'll, I'll, I'll stop. If, oh. if you don't want me to make it too easy. They're no, smart make guys. It easy. Well, Berkey's Let's a smart see. guy. Well, we'll do... Uh, <laughs> he knows us too well. <laughs> and do uh, this. Draw some dingleberries here. Oh, no. So there's low-hanging fruit in this game. Mm -hmm. So... And uh, yeah, so we'll. Uh, I'm I'm drawing this board from memory. There we from go. From memory. Yeah. Well, he's younger than us, so it's probably okay. Here we go. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of little squares, and there's a board. There's tiles that are off, and then it on the bottom there's minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six. And I think and it keeps like, going on. Yeah. And there's, there's, it goes up from like five tiles, four tiles, three tiles, two tiles, one tile. Well, kind who's of anything a, about tiles? I know what it is. Do you know what it is, Berkey? Um, well, there's that new game. It just came out at Essen. Um, mm -hmm. getting it, huh? Um, it's not my, it's like Mahjong. What's the name of that game? What, um, I have a um, Ab Abdul. Ab Azul. Ab Abdul. Yeah, Abzul. Ab that is right. Abzul. Yay! Yeah. Awesome. So have you ordered it, or you have it coming, or what's the deal? It is in the budget. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna get it as soon as the uh, local Goodwill store has it on its shelves. <laughs> we're buying it like that. Yep. Snatching it up. That sounds like me. <laughs> My, my wife and I have uh, been loving playing. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going blank. With the on church, it. church. Yeah, the glass window. Window. Glass window. Glass window. Santiago. Oh, Sagrada. 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 There we go. Been loving Sagrada's Sagrada. Great. And people say, if you like Sagrada, you'll like Azul. So we uh, actually played it for the first time at our last Academy Game, game Night that we have every week. And uh, okay. now it's on my buy list. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, I hear really good things about it. Scott Alden, we had him on from Board Game Geek, and he was talking about it then, and he that was one of his favorite games of 2017. So It, it is a fantastic game. Why didn't we think about that at 1UP? I don't like playing with Scott Alden, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like playing with him either. So, part three. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me, had, Scott. You hear me, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he's a he's a great guy. Scott was a fun show. Okay, part three. Uh, what is your current favorite game? The one you're playing the most and dreaming about while you're working, and uh, maybe you're taking it to bed at night. And, that, and so you're going to give us five one-word clues, and we're going to guess after each one. You cannot use the word of, of the title sure. of the game or the sure. designer. I'm sorry. I had my headphones off. I didn't hear anything you, can't you said. You use the designer's name or oh. the name of the game. In it. I don't know who the designer is, and I can't <laughs> pronounce the name of the game. So we're lucky. <laughs> but it's your favorite. I We play that a lot, and it's probably one of my favorite games of all time, yes. Okay. Well, there you go. So I give you a clue first. Yep. yep one word clue. Hey, senor, donde voy hoy? Now, which one of those one words is it? Yeah, I'm wondering which <laughs> one word is it. Hey? Okay, I'll say it senor? again. Senor? Um, um, hola. 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 Like, okay. ol aloha? No, hola. Spanish. Hola. Domingo. El, El Gocho, I'm going to guess. 
No, no but close. Um, mm. My next oh. clue. My next clue. Water. Water. Well, yeah, yeah, there we go. I actually have a good clue for that. Okay, you're right. next then. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so we, I'll, we I'll have replace we that. Water and we one. have cola. All right. Oh, you're, you're, wait a minute. You're countering my yes, clue? Yes. I, I want to say Tigris and Euphrates. Two words. Oh. That's three words. That's okay. three words. That's Tigris and Euphrates. No. We want well, Tigris one word. Tigris and Euphrates, it's but the top and top sign top. is not a word. Well, those are your next three clues. Tigris and Euphrates. Euphrates. See, this is how we win games. We just cheat. <laughs> So all, you, all your board games, that it, underneath the board, there's a little secret compartment where you can pull out that extra meeple and stick it on the, on the on the board without anyone else seeing them. You know, you laugh about that, but every single thing I have in my drawer has, like, little secret compartments underneath. Oh, my God. That I don't want people going at, you know, so. You're as bad as my dad with the monopoly even, money. He even cuts out the middle pages of his rule book. Hey, so quite, he quite. Hide quite. Stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> you better be careful because it's not a, a, a gun or a, 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 a crossbow or anything. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Number one, you're losing. We, bang! We live in Ohio, okay? So everybody, <laughs> <laughs> no, guns. nobody hides their gun. Yeah, what am I talking about silly. hiding your guns? That's just dishonest. <laughs> okay, so it's a Ryder Kenichia game. What's the camel one? What's the camel one? <laughs> oh. Camel Cup. Oh, no, mm -hmm. Brian Akinitia didn't design Camel Cup. <laughs> or, or Camel. Marco Polo. Across the desert. No, we don't no. like we don't like Germans, so we don't play German people games. Uh, okay, yeah, I knew that about you. Not you, oh. Uva. Damn it. Uva. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I didn't say ooh, you. Uh, well, just because it's, I, it's written U W E, it's not you. Don't say you. Uva. Uva. I always say Uva. So, you just said you. No, yeah. Bad. Really bad. <laughs> no, okay. <it's> bad. <laughs> I guess the fourth clue, one word clue. It'll be three words. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, no, oh, 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 I have... oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm going to give you it. the next clue. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming, which I will not show, to carry me home. It's, it's, so, I didn't know. I didn't know they had internet in the insane silence. Uh, no, take take the coming gesture. <laughs> and the designers. The designers. Last name. <laughs> what happened to our show? What happened? It's like, where did we get so, these guys? You just take the last name of the designer, combine it with Swing Low Sweet Chariot, <laughs> with Hola, Jose, Como Estas, and Tigris and Oifra, and you should have this down. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> See, okay. there they go again. Think colors. It all comes together like a Jerry Seinfeld show. I could say Red Green Show. Oh, the Red Green Show. I That's love a good that show. show. Yeah, I yeah. do too. If you've ever <laughs> watched Canadian you guys, programming, I don't know if they get Barry Canadian. had to turn off his mic because he is just laughing hysterically. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. All right. And these well, are all legitimate clues, if you believe it or not. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. But swing low, sweet chariot. So it's Coliseum. No. All right. What's your next oh, clue? I'm, I'm going to say <laughs> bandits. Bandits. Good one. Mm -hmm. Very important part of the game. Bandits. Very important. Bandits. Like Pancho Villa? I know, and uh, we go way back. We had lunch together. Okay. This is St. Pancho Villa. We're talking about Mexican outlaw. Being a history guy, 
I'm going to, oh, you can't see. I'm going to show you right now a big clue. A big clue. It's his ear. Wait, wait, wait. Why are you showing them that? It's not a big clue. He's joking with us. <laughs> no, it's a big clue. What I did you see? on the wrong flag. It was the oh. Mexican flag? It's an old Spanish flag. Mm. Old Spanish flag. But 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 what colors were the old Spanish flag? Red, white, and green. They were black Jesus. and white. If you watch all the old films, all the old Spanish flags were in black and white. Like <laughs> English flags. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Damn what it. What are we doing? Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Oh, oh, oh. I, I have another clue for them. Oh, the Damn it. Oh, oh, pick me. Oh, pick me. <laughs> hey, what does a fish say when it swims into a wall? Bob. Ouch. I just said it. Damn, Damn it. <laughs> That's a clue. That's a clue. Damn it. Is it uh, <laughs> 2004. I'm looking, at, I'm, I'm looking at the chat now because I'm, 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 I'm totally I'm lost. Gonna go and to the normally chat there's too. someone there, like Kabuki Kid, who has the answer. But no, okay. Kabuki Kid just wants to talk about my Black Shabbos t-shirt. Um, El, <laughs> Altiplano. She no. said Altiplano. No. no, no, no. That ain't it. This is their favorite game of all time. They've played this for years. Um, I didn't say good, favorite game great. of all time. It's one we play a lot and I really love. It. Okay. It's always one we're willing to play. Okay. Think about, think about probably nowadays. Oh, farming. Farming. Yeah, that's a good clue. It is. It's farming. Bandits. Bandits. Well, that's like El Gaucho. Is it, so is it the clues. Carson City? Damn it. Oh, no. Close, actually. Damn it! I, I I like that game a lot too. I just got the deluxe edition. Damn it! Sam I have that with all that. He's mm -hmm. he's just cursing on us. Fed dumped. Fed dumped. <laughs> Damn it! What do you what do you English people say in France? Did he just call me dumb cuff? No, fed dumped. <laughs> um okay, what's another clue? These guys don't play a lot of games. No. Seven a week. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, you it's, it's not El Gaucho. Th think building little buildings. Okay. Uh, oh, in, what's that? In, in, in Mexico. In Mexico. And, and you've in, got you've got little brown road tiles. That you can put next to the buildings. Oh, that's Catan! You told me you didn't no, like no. Jerry games. No, 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 no. But close. No, no, I know what it is. It's Alhambra. Oh, God. Okay, we, we just should give it away now. We should, should we give it away? I don't think yeah. they're going to get it. No. Okay. Little roads. Hold it. We're, we're on to something well, here. No, I didn't they're, say little roads. They're like little roads. I said they're little wooden things like the little roads. And every time that they are placed, you say, damn it. <laughs> You'll place them. Damn it. Well, double dumbass on you. <laughs> I think they've done a little bit too much LDS. Yeah. It has a little bit of care for me. Berkeley. They've got, they've got Pancho Villa in it even. Mexica. Kabuki Kid says Mexica. No. No. So we shall go right, down the right. river and drive out all the pheasants. I, I like I pheasants my a lot. Pal. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm stumped. We better okay. we better let them tell us. Ready? One, two, yeah. three. Dos, Dos Rios. Rios. What? That sounds like a biscuit. You've never heard of Dos, Dos? Rios? No. What are the most uh, wasn't that just a Spiel de Jars nominated a while ago? I I, Back in 2004. Dos Rios is a phenomenal. If you've never played Dos Rios, it is one of the most fun. Backstabbing, backstabbing game ever. You're you're far. You're trying to farm this valley in Mexico, but <laughs> only farms that go along the two rivers that come from the mountains will let you score. And the terrible thing is that 
you can place dams that redirect the river that can completely ruin people's farming plans. Oh. So it, it is yeah. it is a it's a great uh, resource production, you know, but maybe the you problem kind of is it's or a damn you kind of game. Maybe just Can you imagine play playing these game. games with these guys? You know, Badger. I mean, these guys they they get after. I can tell that things really go askew playing with these two. Well, I'll I'll tell you. Once when I was younger, my I I caused my father to have negative three points and ticket to ride. Yeah, negative negative three <laughs> points. That's how that's how cutthroat and at each other's throats we are in these games. Sometimes Ooh. it's not about who gets the highest score, but who does not get the lowest. Uh, no, how bad is screw? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. So and there is in, always in further in further Berkey and Badger news. Uh, Academy Dames is taking over Smirk and Dagger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Stumping Kabuki Kid, the most powerful and mind in board gaming ever. The <gasps> most powerful mind in board gaming ever. Kabuki yes. Kid. Yes. Wow. Yeah, she's pre she's pretty amazing, actually. Wow. Oh, she didn't well, get it, huh? No. <laughs> Has she at least heard, she she heard the it. game before? Has she, she said she hasn't it? even heard of it. Oh, check, oh my goodness. Check, check out on Board Game yeah. Geek. Fantastic game. Man, who it's, puts it it's, it's Mayfair, like, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I think I've seen oh, it. Yeah. 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 Hey, buy it, buy it before it becomes not available and become a collector's item. I'm telling you, it's the next Bitcoin, people. Yeah. They have yeah. rating right now. Seven rating, about two thousand people. Yeah, no, it's it's a phenomenal game. It's 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 a it's a highly recommended. Um, you know what? I tell people, save your money. Don't support us in Kickstarter. Go buy Dos Rios just because it's such a incredible. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, <laughs> you convinced me there. I was about to pull my pledge. Cancel. <laughs> Well, uh, that was a really great. Uh, we we they they Barry Bob, Bob, Bob Badger they stumped oh, us. We, we got oh and three. Is that number two? No, is that it? was all three questions. No, you yeah I know you got you guys got number two. Oh, we so got number two. So one got, and two. That's, that's we, oh, you won't let me keep you use you as a don't, scoreboard anymore. No, don't mark me anymore. <laughs> Could you tattoo it on his forehead, please? <laughs> Barry didn't like my belly button person, so. I'm not going to let you do my. I don't have a belly button. Okay. <laughs> Time to go to number four of our show, which is our baba babble topic. Barry, send us away. I'm trying. Um, oh I, I've totally lost the plot. I'm clicking wrong buttons again. That's why we do a pro audio edit that everybody can really enjoy listening to. And uh, hopefully, this is the right music. Do no do, speakers, do. speakers have gone to sleep. Do it's time for the babble, 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 Oh, today, the battle topic is the Kickstarter evolution. And we have with us Uva and Gunta Eichert from Academy of Games, Apollo Games, experts at Kickstarter, talking about all this stuff. Barry, what kind of things do you want to start us off talking about with this Kickstarter evolution, if you will? Well, I was going to introduce you to my friend Colin, the farmer who lives near Babylon. So, um, <clears throat> well, that being said, yes. um, a thing that I'd been searching for for years as a little kid is there was a song I had heard and I never heard it again, and I heard it for the first time. Ich bin schon a kleine Mietze Katze für mein Wochenendhaus. I just want to put that out there that I found a song that I heard as a little kid and I heard it again last week. Wow, that, that is completely random. <laughs> well, he was talking about calling the farmer, so I figure I could bring in. The Mita cuts a song. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, what I do on the on the um, audio podcast is I I cut away to inside Babylon because we have got this imaginary world called Babylon where Berkey is the king and I am the jester and we have we have the Babylonites oh. in our in our village 
talk to yes. us and ask it's us some questions, advice. which we pose to our guests and ourselves. <clears throat> and it's a good tie into our Kickstarter because the main antagonist of the game, Dr. Babylon, is named Dr. Ah. Babel. His nickname was Dr. Babel because he loves to talk about his maniacal plans oh. like any good villain wow, yeah. blah, 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 he babbles blah. about it and yeah yeah i might have to put this on later because i, I think i've lost my voice when we'll be laughing <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i'll be able to do a good <clears throat> farmer accent i have a quick go <clears throat> all right give her a shot there I'll be, I'll be, all right well, let's get into colin now hello hello there i'm colin i'm a farmer i, I live Next to Babylon, but I don't live in Babylon. And I'm calling the farmer because I like growing things like cucumbers and cauliflowers and cabbages and kumquats. And uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, you might find some crab apples in my stock. Well, every now and again, I go into the town of Babylon and I see all my friends, and I sell my wares to them, and uh, they, they, all the, all the Babylites, they love playing games. And they've been asking me about this thing called Kickstarter, and I know not about this Kickstarter thing. But hopefully, some friends who are, who are listening to this might be able to help us out. Right, all I've heard is that this Kickstarter thing started way back in 2009, BC. And... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's one of those things where lots of people will give their money to make other people's dreams come true. And um, it sounds very, very intriguing. And I was wondering, what's going on with this thing? What's the potential of having to give your money to someone to make their dream come true? Can't you just, like, go to sleep and dream yourself? Hmm. So, anyway, I went and asked the royal King Berkey, and his our, our right hand uh, jester uh, badger, uh, what they thought about Kickstarter and where is it going and what's it for? Because I like to kickstart things like my cows. Clarissa likes a good old kicking before she gives me any milk. So uh, there you go. Take it away, King Burke. Wow, that was better than I thought. Wow. <laughs> Well, it is time to babble about crowdfunding. I, I tell you what's interesting about the hobby is we've seen this renaissance of board gaming and we've seen Kickstarter become somewhat of a phenomenon. In 2016, we saw $100 million uh, generated due to Kickstarter crowdfunding in the board game segment. And last year, we saw $136 million uh, in growth in that same segment. So like a 30% increase in Kickstarter funding for board games. Um, these numbers are starting to become really significant. And uh, it, it's, it's sort of a crazy thing. You know, the, we titled this episode, The Kickstarter Evolution, because there was a day where Kickstarter crowdfunding platforms, which I think for our purposes, Kickstarter is one of the most prolific. Uh, they, they, they were, you know, here, here's my dream on a napkin. I've got this idea. Will you help me achieve this? And there was this, this, this sense of, hey, we want to help you with your dream type of thing. But now Kickstarter has evolved and we're seeing a lot of different things. Um, in uh, Barry, I put some notes here in the top 10 Kickstarter projects. Now, this is overall top 10 Kickstarters, not just board games. The top 10, um, three of them were board or card games. Kingdom Death Monster, 12 million bucks. Uh, Exploding Kittens, $8.7 million. The Seventh Continent, $7 million. Um, this is crazy amounts of money. So things are happening in Kickstarter. Barry, what do you, what do you think about all this? Uh, well, I was I was always skeptical about Kickstarter. Um, you know, it just seemed like, you know, why do I want to invest money in a game which might not be good when it finally comes out? But there have been publishers that have jumped to Kickstarter, and there have been publishers who started out on Kickstarter, uh, like uh, Stonemire Games. Mm -hmm. who, hmm? Yeah, oh, correct. Uh, so, yeah. And um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. 
they just jump onto Kickstarter and they 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 start their business from there, and they do produce some really great games. And um, we have our Gunter and I'm sorry, I'm losing the plot now. Very um, yes. The last time you had sex forty years ago, your partner was going right at the important time. Ooh ooh ooh. Just remember that. Forty years ago, it was my mum and dad having sex. <laughs> oh, now I'm beginning to feel really old. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Ah, uh, they're they're and, just won our dice tower rating. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I know, but I'll edit that out. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> and Uva and Gunter there, they have now jumped onto Kickstarter. And my question to them is, why? Why this jump? Well, we've been on Kickstarter for uh, this is our sixth project now. Yeah, is it? We do about yeah, we, we do it. about every third game on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why is this. Uh, we go through full distribution. We try to uh, support the stores, et cetera, et cetera. When we do that, if let's say a game sells for $50, we earn, out of 50, we get $16 through how the market works in America. So out of that $16, we have to pay the printing costs, the shipping to America, the development, the overhead, the royalties, everything. So in general, let's say a $50 game, our cost of prints $10. We get $16 because the stores get about 50% off. So they're buying it at $25. The wholesalers are buying it roughly for $20 or $18. And then reps, things like that, like PSI and all that, get their 15%. So at $6 has to last us that we survive. The problem mm -hmm. is, let's say we buy 10,000 games. They cost us $10 each. We have to sell over 60% of them just to even get our printing cost money back. Then hopefully the dealers and stores sell or pay their bills on time. With that remaining money, you're trying to cover expenses that you had a year previously. Wow. It makes it almost impossible. That's why it is so difficult for new companies to break into the industry because the, the cash flow is almost impossible. And that's why they say the gaming industry is the best way to lose a million dollars. You know, you have to have money to really finance it. Kickstarter, though, on the other hand, you get roughly around 70% or 60% of the MSRP which means that you have so much more money to be able to put into development of really cool items to get extra people in to help develop it make the art better to pay for miniatures the molding everything else and when you have to pay the printer five to six months before it even hits the market you have money to pay them then when it hits the market you have money to wait another three or four months till the stores and the dealers and the wholesalers pay you Mm -hmm. And you have the money that you don't have to wait literally nine months to get the money back to break even on your inventory run if you have a good selling game. And let's be honest, the majority of games are not great sellers. They're, they either start with very low print runs or they just don't do as well as the publisher was expected. I mean, how, how many games came out last year? Yeah, like what six thousand games came out last year? Yeah, mm -hmm. crazy number in America alone. And, and the problem is, even the popular games like Dos Rios, they <laughs> they <laughs> hit, they make a splash, and they disappear. Right. So now all of a sudden you have all your expenses, all your art, everything done. You do a first print run. You hope and pray it sells through. It sells through. But remember, you got to sudden a ton of them out for reviews. You have to get. The cost and expenses are incredible. So now you want to come out with your next game. Well, you can't start your next game till you sold 70% of your previous game. Right. And of that 70%, you got to pay the royalties, the artists, and all that. It is a very difficult business. So, what's the other way to go? Let's cut out all distribution, all stores, sell direct through the internet. Mm. But then 
you don't have a lot of people selling and pushing the game. You're sitting yeah, in your limited. backyard shipping out of your garage. So all of a sudden, Kickstarter comes in. And the stores go, we will not support your game if you go on Kickstarter because you're undercutting us. Every single one of our games that is popular on Kickstarter, we literally sell five times more to a store than if we don't Kickstarter it. Yeah. So our distribution sales is five times higher by doing a Kickstarter than if we don't do a Kickstarter. Yeah, it, I think what's been happening because of Kickstarter, having such a strong marketing presence, um, mm -hmm. it gets those titles out there and gets that project in front of so many eyes that that has a cumulative effect on the backside when you go to distribution because people are hearing about it and and depending on upon availability and those kind of things. Right. Well, what it really helps us also is like our current Kickstarter, the Agents of Mayhem. This is based on Saints Row series. The video gamers, it, it really doesn't help you. It does, you. There's no real draw through there. Mm. But what it does do, having to do a Kickstarter such as ours, we have to have the game almost finished by the time we do a Kickstarter. Oh, yes. With us. Yeah. Now, we have an advantage because we're an established company. We've already had all the miniature art sculpts made. The artwork has been worked on over a year. And even to this day, with even the Kickstarter we had, we're still learning. We're blown away. People are going, you need all these videos. You need this. You need that. One of the I want, to, I want to go over that quickly. Like one of the problems with this game we had over others. If you like remember our Martin Nostrum or our Vikings or 1775 or Freedom, some of the other games we did on Kickstarter, those were pretty normal board games where they had a flat mat, they used wooden cubes, some dice, some cards. We could really easily make a prototype, usually just a printed paper map, some cards we have made at Game Crafters or something. They're pretty mm -hmm. standard components. So it made it pretty easy for us to send them out to reviewers beforehand to get some reviewer videos and uh, co uh, quotes for a Kickstarter. However, Apes of Mayhem has yes, so yes. much new stuff. This you cannot easily prototype. I mean, to make our board of nine tiles, it takes over a week, two guys working just to make a single one of these prototypes. Yeah, and that's a lot cutters. of man out And that's, that's just the board. Yeah. yeah. Then we have these really cool double layer boards. There's two layers of printed art on the bottom with another layer of cardboard printed on top that we have to laser cut or hand cut out. That's another week of work just doing these player boards. Mm -hmm. Then the game comes with over 200 cards. So that's un we have to make sure that those are all edited, the wording's right, that's clear. So this game in particular comes with so much stuff and so much stuff that's not standard. And then well, when think, you had mentioned it, we, it, it's hard yeah. to prototype those kind of things for uh, Kickstarter. I, I think that's one of the things about Kickstarter because we're talking about the evolution. You know, back in the day, you had a game that wasn't even fully developed. They hadn't yeah, even fully right. play tested the right. product. They had a conceptual uh, thing. Yeah. A lot of times they had. I remember. I remember seeing when Code Names came out. Now, I, of course, they did. They didn't Kickstart Code Names. Yeah, they didn't kickstart code no. names, but I, I I I demoed it with Josh at Dice Tower Con on pieces of 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 paper with the words, and he had this crappy little box, and people right. started playing it and just loved it. But those days are gone. Now you have to have a fully developed set of art assets so yeah. that because otherwise your your product just won't be noticed anymore. In a fantastic Kickstarter video which are expensive to produce. They're getting more and more uh, sophisticated. Yeah. Now you're actually seeing, in a board game video, CGI animation. Mm. They're oh, yeah. They're cool figures. They're actually starting to animate these figures. And a small new, new person comes out with the first game, they can't just even do that. And when people start trying to compare these new designers who are trying to get their first game out there compared to these established companies who can do all this cool stuff, I, I it well it's you you really are seeing a change in Kickstarter I think in that the, way. The 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 big for Kickstarter now the way it's evolving the big um benefit the the companies that are or the people benefiting from Kickstarter the most I think are companies such as ours smaller established publishers who aren't like the big asthma days and the fantasy flights were and et cetera et cetera the Mayfairs. <laughs> um 
we don't have 100 games or 50 games in our wheelhouse where we have enough residual sales on a monthly basis through the wholesale market to get a good money and to pay all our fixed expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, we live, we have to come out with new games, but like our companies, we, we don't throw 20 games on the wall and hope one or two stick and those are going to become our best sellers. Every we one like, of our games has been a huge success uh, from both the review and the customer. Well, yeah, standpoint. because we do very few. And there are a lot of publishers like us that have a lot of time and effort put into it. And we would not survive without a Kickstarter until we get established. And the, and the number is you have 20 games in your repertoire. Once you mm -hmm. have 20 published games, then there's enough residual sales that you get enough monthly income. So Kickstarter, in my mind, is critical. And I think it's evolving now where even stores are now becoming more involved, where stores can get the store versions at a store yeah. price and then offer it to their customers. But that is where this whole circular with Amazon, everything can screw stuff up. Because all of a sudden, you'll have someone like us coming out with a Kickstarter. And let's say it's a, like ours is a $90 Kickstarter, but you're getting like five expansions with it because of all the stretch goals and everything. And then some online- So it's like $200 worth of product. Yeah, and then some online person will come in and offer just the base game. They're just guessing, oh, $90. It'll cost me, you know, $45. I'll sell for $55. And they put it online for $55. Months before the game is even scheduled to be released at distribution. Or even while the Kickstarter is running. Yeah. yeah. And that is just has such, again, negative consequences. So finally, it's, it's a marketplace I think is going to even out in that the online discarders, the stores and everything, have to realize that everybody has to make money. And that's where it all ties together again, also with Eagle Games and Dom and all them doing a mapping system, a manufacturer's You're talking uh, about suggested, North Star Games. Uh, North Star Games, yeah. Star, with their, yeah. their mapping, you know, the manufactured suggested pricing, where they're saying, you cannot sell this game. If you want this game, you're going to sign this piece of paper that says you cannot discount it more than 20%. That way, we, the North Star, or us, can keep coming out with really good games. And we've been approached by two companies that all they do in life is make sure that your mapping is kept throughout the whole internet. On the hour, they go through the entire internet searching, and if anybody undercuts your price anywhere, boom, within an hour, you know about it, and wow. you can take action. So the market is rapidly um, catching up. It's been a few years of chaos, but I think it's going to be interesting. So with the Amazons, with the online stores with the mapping with the kickstarters it's i think going to settle and something's going to give and i think what's going to give is that publishers such as ourselves are going to get enough funds to make beyond expectation games and stores will survive because these games will show what's cool and i think it's going to be a, a way to get more good games to the gamers they're going to purchase more, but the quality of gameplay is going to go up. Do you feel that the quality of the game, not just the, the quality of the mechanics, but the quality of the components um, has put a lot more pressure on you in regards to Kickstarter? I mean, if, oh. like, say, for instance, <laughs> um, Mira Nostrum. Oh, rising Sun, be, you've got oh, these amazing production values right but take take your first game that you put on kickstarter if it, you put it on kickstarter now do you think it would it still made the same amount of money or would it made less because you're using wooden cubes and it's just a, a normal actually, board actually we were have always been known for really good quality of our games and I, I actually feel that the market's been catching up to our quality yeah but what's coming on kickstarter now what's selling mm -hmm. And this is one yeah. of the complaints and one of the problems we're even having with our with our um, agents of mayhem is games now, and this is a short time cycle again. Now it's all about how many miniatures can you throw in there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're throwing tons of miniatures, and you have a game, a very basic game that's very repetitive, and you're getting the miniature set. Oh, and now we're going to throw another twenty miniatures in. So you can just put new miniatures in and play the same repetitive That, that doesn't really significantly change the actual game play. flow of the game. Right. So there, right now, it's the bling thing, cool tons of minis, subpar gameplay. But then you get stuff like 
Gloomhaven, which didn't have tons of super minis, mm -hmm. but an incredible gameplay mechanic to it. Or mm -hmm. even like Charterstone, which is very, very a basic game. But it's but addictive. Some really innovative idea. Yeah, very innovative. What what Jamie Stonemeyer has been doing lately is phenomenal. And I'm online just hooting, blowing horns for these guys because what they're doing is phenomenal. And that's what we're doing with our historical games and some of our others. So it is a little difficult because of the overproduction coming in for mm -hmm. some very good games to shine. But these games, once they hit the market, they have legs, they grow, and then the next, second, third games of these designers blossom. I mean, look look how, like, uh, yeah, you're right about the growth. Look how 1775, which is a birth of game, compared to Vikings, uh, Vikings made... Ten times more. Yeah, and uh, there, it, it just shows how over the years you grow this fan falling of these systems. Right. And you see that with Zombicide 2, for example. Z yeah. the what the zombies now are making a lot more than the original zombicide did yeah. and that, that's well i think standard. when you have when you have companies that have a pedigree and have proven that they can deliver on their kickstarters you're seeing those companies have an advantage over that new guy that hasn't been tested and one yeah. of the things i've i've also seen as an evolution is that initially it seemed like a lot of the games were in a much lower price point category. It seemed like there was a target range of that 25 to 35, $40. Now you're seeing titles that are, are, are in their tier levels are 60 and 70 and $90 because of the demand for all the bling, like you say, the toys and, and the extra uh, production value. But also one of the things that's evolved so much is shipping because oh, oh yeah. I mean, you, you know, Uva, and I know of yeah. real intimately now about, about transit costs, getting your product yeah. to the States, getting it to distribution, yeah. just those fees and, and incorporating that is, is a significant thing. But then how to get that to your end user yeah. uh, affordably and where you used to see these games, hey, get your game for 40 bucks and shipping included. Now you're not, that, that model's going away well, because what, you can't really absorb good. that 20 bucks. Well, because those people are out of business. Yeah, they they did. They, it was bad financial playing where they were not able to, because usually a lot of them were new to. They maybe were game enthused, had a game idea for a game, but very few of the people that start these kickstarters actually have business experience well, that prepares them for, for all example, the unknown difficulties. Our game mm -hmm. right now that we're that are, are um, Age of May, uh, Agents of Mayhem, Pride of Babylon, uh, our shipping to Europe cost is $18. So people pay another $18 to get it. The game weighs between 11 and 13 pounds. Mm -hmm. We have to ship it from China and America, components made in both places, to Europe. Then we have to pay all the VAT taxes. Right. We eat the VAT taxes because we're Euro-friendly. Then the custom tax, everything else, by the time we're done, our average cost to ship that game is roughly $30. So we are augmenting the price for shipping in the price of the game even because people have no idea you're getting the base game all these expansions um i just got another great game um uh what was the one with all the uh, eric lang did it with all the the, the blood blood right rising blood. sun right so oh, we got that's a fun game too I, we and we also got the i think that's a uh, parthenon yeah, but called? you get Mythic so it's, it's huge boxes Mythic battles. yeah yep. and the problem is is that it is so expensive, and freight shipping has gone up 10% in the last year. Wow. Uh, even us getting container ships from mm -hmm. China, they'll sit on the dock almost two to three weeks, and we'll tell people, hey, it's going, it's being shipped. It was picked up from the printer, and then like two weeks later, we have to go online and say, it's still sitting at the port just trying to get a container ship. Because there's so much business going on between the U.S. and uh, China. And, and Europe. So uh, the the – our biggest challenge nowadays is the shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's interested in Kickstarter, put a lot of, lot of, lot of thought into your shipping because the shipping is going to cost you three times more than you think it will. Now, I, I kind of wanted to bring up a new subject because I think it's, there's an interesting correlation here with Kickstarter because uh, I think Kickstarter started in 2009. Yep. Um, right, right when the, we were in that big recession that started in 2008, a lot of people lost their jobs, mm -hmm. and one Kickstarter allowed people who were looking for something new to to 
make their new ideas come to life because they didn't have another option they could rely on anymore. But now we are, are we we've come out of that recession since uh, several years ago, and and we're doing overall people are doing very well. And I think you can actually track how Kickstarter's changed from the recession era Kickstarter mm. to the non-recession era Kickstarter. And, and I'm interested because economies eventually we're going to have a dip it's it's inevitable whether it'll recession come, yeah. yeah we don't know when it's going to come but it'll come sometime how kickstarter will react to that and and uh i think that's an important thing to understand when you're looking you see how kickstarters have gone from when you're right the early kickstarters were very cheap and it wasn't just because of that's that that's what people could afford at that time and now they're getting more um deluxe and luxurious because yeah. people are able to uh, afford and and they want to indulge uh, in well, those kind of It's becoming a lifestyle for a lot of people also. Yeah. I mean they're they're not and the market the growing. They're playing games. I bet I bet there's twice as many gamers as there were in 2009. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, but, one of the things that really surprised me when we did our Game Toppers Kickstarter is the amount of people who are referred to as super backers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I looked at my list because I had my regular board game theater Kickstarter login and then at Game Toppers and I was supporting friends projects and different ones. So I had two separate accounts, but I counted up all the ones that I've supported over the last five years and it was 48 projects. Wow. Well, to me, that was like a big number. Um, but to some people, that's like you, you just don't support the community because these people are 250 backers. I believe it is to be a super backer. I saw somebody with a thousand. Wow, I was, I, that's that was crazy to me. I mean, no, we love them. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I love them, but, but I, I could not imagine myself doing that because of because well, uh, you're poor. You oh, could yeah. do a dollar a pledge. That's all you got to do. One thousand dollars. There you go. That's tell true. Me, that's tell, true. tell me if you experienced this. I experienced yeah. this in the you know I shared that poem from a backer. Uh, that he wrote and and how passionate the people were about our campaign and 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 the things that they said and the feedback I received that they really felt invested. They yeah. really wanted to help. Um, do you get that kind of feedback with, you know, ours was a big ticket item, obviously a luxury ticket item, but uh, how do you get that same kind of feeling from your backers that they're there to really help you? You know, I, uh, I want I, I want to say that our current backers have been some of the best we've ever had yeah they are so unbelievably positive and supportive and excited yeah. about this game and and I've, I've actually noticed how how enthusiastic they are and and i want to say to any of our backers listening now i mean it, it's greatly appreciated on our, our end because we work so hard very long nights yeah. um my wife who, yeah. who's not an employee of the company has been working pretty full days helping us with the customer service and stuff while she's taking care of our newborn child. And yeah. uh, we, it's really a family business here. We, we get the whole family involved to make these Kickstarters successful. And uh, having that positive, that that recognition from the supporters, it, is, uh, it, it, it helps you sleep better at night. Well, Berkey, you know what it's like. I mean, we put in literally, I haven't slept more than four or five hours a night mm -hmm. since this one started. And that is like, I'm here all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Most of our people are here working their tails off, just even answering the hundreds of comments oh, that come in. And it amazing. isn't just even on We love the comments. We love them. But yeah, it's now we have to- Something we have to do. You have to cover Board Game Geek. You have to cover uh, Facebook, Kickstarter, Steam. Um, yeah, Instagram, while Twitter. We are Twitter. Advertisements out there, doing interviews with- Gentlemen right. like you, um, noted and, noted internet internet minor superstars. Meaning yes. yes, yes, yeah, and yeah. not not minor in terms of underage. Well, no, he's just got a bad host. <laughs> no, <laughs> undersized, undersized. Oh, undersized so dingleberry podcasters like us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but our our backers have been really really, and they do get involved. They want to see. They we've had several people ask, how can we help make this this more successful right and, and so we're trying to give them ways either through social media stretch goals where they can share something on their facebook or twitter or, or well, even more though they social media we, accounts we get people you know you're working all day long you're, it's like 10 30 at night and you're just dead yeah. tired and you still have so much to do 
And then all of a sudden you get guys coming on. Uh, I had a young lady the other day said, hey, we love your old games. We see what you're doing. This is so cool. Hey, thanks a lot. Is there anything I can do? And you know what? That is such a pick em. And oh, I think yeah. that that is where I think supporters' understanding of the industry and how much time and effort put people on is also evolving. Because I feel maybe it's just our games, but the messages that we're getting online now compared to some older games mm -hmm. are more and more positive. They're really positive. And, and what's in general. And what's interesting, some of our biggest critics in the past. Are are now our biggest supporters. Yeah, hmm. and 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 I I think that speaks very well of us that we were able to prove to these people that were very critical of because they may have gotten burned on other Kickstarters uh, now have that kind of faith in us. Well, I think and, in um, general, I think yeah. in general, I, I you know I, I support a lot of games also, and I go on the comment section. And I think in general, you you don't have as much trolling anymore. It's 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 well, really becoming we we Less have a toxic. great yes exactly well, we have a great industry in general. i think the board game industry is one of the, the most positive industries out there and i think that it's because of the face-to-face -face community nature of board games right. it, board gaming is not about the it's really not about the game you're playing it's about getting together with friends or it's about new experience people become friends exactly. and having great experiences yeah. Yeah. and and that it's that that really forms a positive community that you have people that are they they want to uh see the whole industry succeed and grow so kickstarter yeah. is i feel evolving. like we're a religion sometimes yep <laughs> come play for, come to my game night yeah become well and I, I found that I found that there was actually innovation in in the conversation because, like for instance, we had wood wooden cup holders and, and component trays, and one of the one of the things that, that didn't become toxic but became a comment was, "Hey, you know where the table cut the topper comes together and you got this connector cleat? You can't put a cup there because it's occupying that eight inches." Well, we were able to come up and innovate because of that if you want to call it a complaint or that observation, we were able to go to this new high density polypropylene material and make a cutout so that we could put that. Well, that happened from this discussion with backers getting their feedback and being able to innovate. And I'm, I'm sure you've probably had similar things like, well, why can't you make a recessed cardboard board so your tokens don't fall off? Right. Well, I, we, we did have one of those already that we're going to be adding to the uh, Kickstarter hopefully soon. Which we have uh, it, little cars that we've already unlocked that you can drive around in, in the board game. And uh, somebody came up with the idea. It's like, well, why, why don't you put ramps in the game? I want to be able to drive off a ramp on top of a roof to attack my enemy with my car on top of the roof. Take no, out the not sniper. attack, to love bump them. Yeah. But <laughs> the, uh, I, I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So now we have our artists working, finishing up a, a little Gret ramp tile that we can add to the game. And, and I, I love getting those kind of ideas from uh, yeah. a backer because, um, and that's why we play tests. I mean, we'll, but, we'll. But then for every 20 really good people, you get one really caustic person who makes comments. Mm -hmm. And those are the people where you just wish, you know, you're being so caustic, don't support the game, leave. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've, I've known there's people. There's not many of them, but no, it's not many. There are a few, and they never go away. <laughs> they swear everything, and every game you come out with, they'll still buy it. But I think they just do it so they can be on the bulletin boards and just bitch about stuff. And it's like, <laughs> dude, you know, well, why we, don't you just move to France with the other English guys? And, <laughs> you know, but it's especially frustrating because every once in a while, you, you do get a troll who will say purposely false or inflammatory things. And uh, that that's it's depressing. But but here's where the board game industry is great and our, our supporters and backers are great. We usually don't have to sound defensive and defend ourselves right. to say, that's not actually what happened, this was the truth. A backer, a past backer, or one of our fans will come in and say, right. wait, that's not my experience. That I don't think that's true. And, and that's we appreciate when our supporters do that. They they recognize when somebody's just trying to troll, and that that it's the best to help the people that do not know us 
understand the truth. And that's where I yeah, think things are changing. You can allow them to kind of go to bat for you in a sense. I yeah. found that too. And uh, our campaign was very non-toxic. It was very, very cordial. And I was very responsive with people. And that's, I think, uh, you know, back in the day, people didn't know how to do this. Right. Yeah. Um, but now you have experts out there that I would consider Jamie Stegmeier an expert and, and yeah. Richard Bliss and others that that have really analyzed and, and been able to teach us right. how to do a good job. And man, I devoured that information and learned from others. I had several conversations with you, Uva, you know, last year and just be able to learn from other people. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore. You've got a lot of we have a lot of track record and thing that we can we can glean yep. to to do a good job. Learn from all of our mistakes, Berkey. Yeah. <laughs> but too know, many to count. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's the great thing about Kickstarter. Actually, the gamers, I think, are are now a much bigger part of the design process. Mm -hmm. Even our, our rules, you know, our next Storms of Steel, our Conflict of Heroes game. Um, I've got dozens of fans now that are going to be going online and going through the rules, editing them. And guess what? And telling them what, what they don't think is clear or confusing. Right. The rules, everything about games are now becoming better because of supporter involvement. And I think Kickstarter has a big part of that. Yeah, I totally agree. It looks like we've lost Badger. <laughs> so he's probably the guy that's going to hit the, the close button on this. So I'm not sure if he lost his internet connection or whatever, but we'll, uh, I think, uh, I, I think the, the the Kickstarter phenomenon, if you will, um, board games seem to be kind of driving some things in that market. I mean, there's other th projects, obviously, but there's a big amount. I mean, you're seeing how many different pledge manager companies have popped up just to be able to manage the back end of the Kickstarter and that whole administrative process. Yeah, well, I mean, there's BackerKit, there's CrowdOx. We use CrowdOx. We've used BackerKit. They're both phenomenal companies. Now yeah, I use BackerKit and super yeah. happy. Well, and, and I want to add that now also you're seeing some uh, manufacturing startups in the U.S., and which, which is surprisingly challenging because uh, uh, there's a lot of expertise um, and material mm -hmm. that does not have the distribution in the U.S. still that they're having to uh, set up yep. for this for manufacturing in the U.S. to uh, start happening. Yeah, Cardi Mundi is expanding now. Um, Ludofact is now Ludofact USA in Indiana. They're like putting entire new printing lines and card printing lines and everything. So it's it's it, it, the the industry is evolving quickly. And a lot of that I think is because of these massive kickstarters that have these fairly large print runs. Um, that that they don't always want to have to print in the in uh, China or Europe. And it's cheaper now to print in America than going to China with the shipping involved, or or to print for a basic game. If, if if you have worked with a company that has a printing in the U.S. and in Europe, you can print copies in both places yeah. and ship. Not have to wait for half your print run to come overseas. Right. No, so I think that's that's ex exactly it. And you take a look at. Um, uh, the logistical standpoint. And I, I think one of the things too that I was thinking about regarding Kickstarter that it's not only just production, uh, not just uh, production of product now, Kickstarter is being used for a lot of other things. You're seeing media content creators using crowdfunding kickstarter you know the dice tower just ran a successful yes. kickstarter mm -hmm. campaign dan king the game boy geek good friend of mine he's yep. running his season six kickstarter right yep. now to help raise funds from the community to to you know create content and so that's a pretty interesting phenomenon as well